Many of our videos are in essence book reviews since we prefer to quote the classical and modern authors to encourage studying and reflecting these classics. We also record videos on collections of book reviews that can be referenced by other videos who are not overly repetitious. We will also discuss how to read ancient works and the problems scholars face when translating ancient works and the 38 volume set of the writings of the anti-Nicene, anti-meaning before, Nicene and post-Nicene Church Fathers translated into English. And this 38 volume library of the works of the early Church Fathers in the first few centuries of the Church is an invaluable resource for the serious th student of theology and morality and the scriptures also, since many of the writings of the early Church Fathers are really biblical commentaries. All of this collection was compiled in the late 1800s by Protestant scholars and their agenda was to show how the Catholic faith was abandoning its roots. And although now many of these works have more modern translations, this series is still a primary English source for scholars of all denominations. The originally published volumes are generally unavailable, newer used, but there are paperback republications. Since the copyright has long expired, you can also find these works on the internet, or you can purchase a DVD for all these works for under 10 bucks. However, we highly recommend that you purchase the individual volume DVDs from the Christian Book Distributors, as it contains the footnotes from the original translation and also very valuable introductions. And the hundred plus extra dollars you spend on the individual DVDs is money well spent. This vast library is broken down into three sections. The Anti-Nicene Fathers ranges from the second story Apostolic Fathers to various third and fourth century sources, including the liturgies and ancient Syriac documents. And the Nicene and Post-Nicene Church Fathers, Series 1, eight volumes have the writings of St. Augustine, the greatest and most influential of the early Church Fathers, as well as six volumes of the treatises and homilies of St. John Chrysostom. And the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, Series 2, and this is 14 volumes of the works of the Greek Fathers from Eusebius to St. John of Damascus, and the Latin Fathers from St. Hilary to St. Gregory the Great. These works include brief introductions and notes, including variances and readings, references to scripture or literature, and clarifications of obscure passages. They also note corruptions or distortions of patristic testimony. The comprehensive index for all three series is found in volume 10 of the Anti-Nicene Fathers series. This includes a subject index, an index of works sorted by the name of the church father, and an index of biblical references cross-referenced to their quotations in the writings of the Church Fathers. St. Augustine is a special case. All of his major works have been preserved. None have been lost to the sands of history. And recently, even more of his sermons have been discovered. We know this because St. Augustine himself made a list of his major works when he sensed his days on the earth may be coming to an end. In addition to this list of works, St. Augustine also wrote the retractions. These retractions correct common misunderstandings of these works by the Christians of his day and any additional comments or corrections he wanted to make to his works. For the main works of St. Augustine and the Nicene Church Fathers volumes, the applicable excerpts from his final work, Retractions, are printed with the introduction of each work. And our thumbnail is from his key work, On Christian Teaching, also known as On Christian Doctrine, which teaches us how we should read and interpret scriptures, which teaches us we should interpret all scripture with a twofold love of God and love for our neighbor in mind. For the most part, the quality of the translations is acceptable. There are many translators involved. Some translators are better than others. The writing style sometimes is convoluted, and for many of my blogs, I play with the wording, both in this and many other of the ancient works, to clarify them and make them more readable or maybe change from third person to first person to make moral messages more imperative. Now on occasion you'll encounter an archaic usage like, uh, for example, somewhere in St. Augustine the translator has speak leasing, which was synonymous with lying, something you never hear today. Sometimes when the word changes are minor, I'll keep the passage in quotes, but when the editing or rewording is too extreme, part or all of the passage is not in quotes. When comparing the translations of the Anti-Nicene Fathers to more recent translations, I find that surprisingly the late 19th century translations are often just about as good as the newer translations. But there is some unevenness. For example, whoever was translating St. Clement of Alexandria must have gotten weary or perhaps died when he was translating his Stromata, as parts of it is still in the original untranslated Latin. And I might point out the original is in Greek but that's lost. 
Also, when I was listening to the excellent sermons by the late Dr. James Boyce on the Psalms, he constantly complains about St. Augustine's sermons on the Psalms. I presume he was talking about the English translation, though he likely knew Greek. Now, the translators in the introduction to this volume say that to do the sermons of St. Augustine justice, he really needed three volumes. But the publisher only wanted to publish one volume, so maybe something was lost when these sermons were condensed. The primary source of the Greek and Latin writings is the Petrologia Graeca and the Petrologia Latina, collections of the Greek and Latin Church Fathers in their original languages compiled by J.P. Migny from 1841 to 1866. Now, when you see a footnote in the Catholic Catechism referring to PG, PL, or, or PLS, this is the collection they're referring to. And the majority of these works cited will be also in the 38-volume uh, Church Fathers Library. Only a portion of the original Greek and Latin writings have been translated for inclusion in the Church Fathers series. Now, most of the commonly cited patristic works are included, except that the works of St. Cyril and the Cappadocian Church Fathers uh, St. Basil and St. Gregory Nazianzus are underrepresented, although one volume does include the works from St. Gregory of Nyssa. Only a portion of the Greek and Latin originals were translated into English in these 38 volumes of the Anti-Nicene, Nicene, and Post-Nicene Church Fathers, as the original Greek and Latin works fill over 300 volumes. And of course these are smaller volumes, but still. Dr. Wikipedia also has articles that list the works in these volumes, and they are also referenced in our video on learning Koine Greek, where we also discuss where you can find the Greek and Latin original works that are the basis for these translations. Now, how do you read the ancient church fathers? There were no editors in the ancient world. Few ancient works were closely edited, the exceptions being the Old and New Testaments, the Homeric epic poems, the Platonic dialogues, and the Greek plays, and St. Augustine's Confessions, and perhaps Plutarch's Lives. Many ancient writings are very uneven in quality. Many of them would fail if they were submitted as term papers today. By far, the scriptures have the most manuscripts surviving, followed by Plato's dialogues. But it is totally surprising how many of even famous ancient works survive in only a handful of manuscripts, and how many treasured ancient works have been lost, in particular works like Cicero's Hortensius on philosophy, which St. Augustine credits to encouraging him to pursue moral truths through philosophy. This was a type of a mini-conversion on his road back to the church. Many church writings, including most of St. Augustine's writings, were dictated to a scribe. Most biblical commentaries, including those by St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom, are transcripts of actual sermons that the preaching saint may or may not have reviewed. Usually, the original copy of the work has been lost in the sands of history. All we have are copies of copies of copies, with all the errors inherent when copyists are careless. Words or sometimes whole lines can be dropped. Pages are missing. Pages have partially deteriorated. A word can be unwittingly substituted for a similar sounding word, or a scribe can try to correct what he thinks is a copying error and corrupts the text even more. So when a passage in the English is unclear, maybe the passage was unclear when it was transcribed. Or maybe corruptions crept into the text as it was copied over the centuries. Or maybe a precise translation is impossible because the original meanings of the works are lost. Sometimes the only Latin or another translation of the original Greek survives, as in the works by St. Irenaeus and St. Clement of Alexandria. Sometimes a translator has to imagine what the original Greek could have been to try to figure out the original meaning. When reading the Church Fathers, it is helpful to know a little bit of the background of the history of the work. One good example is the early Christian works by St. Irenaeus against heresies, and the works by St. Justin Martyr. And these are works in the generation following the Apostolic Fathers. If you read these works without knowing their background, you may think they read like a rambling discourse. But they decided many of the important theological questions of the early church, including the exact role of the Old Testament in the Christian church. And they first coined the phrases we use to the current day to describe our faith, and they reflected the initial efforts to develop a mature Christian doctrine. Proceeding with the other books we will review, we will begin with our most famous historian, the ancient church historian Eusebius, who lived in the time of Emperor Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor. And we will cut a standalone video on Eusebius sometime in 2022. We have quoted Eusebius quite often in our videos on the individual 2nd century apostolic fathers, and he's an invaluable source for how the early church formed a consensus on what books would be included in the New Testament canon. 
Eusebius is also an invaluable source for the early Christian martyrdom, often describing them in gruesome detail. And the first volume of the second series of the Nicene and post-Nicene Church Fathers include the church history by Eusebius, plus his hagiography of his boss, Emperor Constantine the Great. And the second volume of the series includes the church histories for the approximately 140 years after Eusebius by Socrates, Scholasticus, and Sosomenus, both who hail from Constantinople. These are primarily histories of the Eastern Greek Church, and these are important sources for the history of the apostate pagan Emperor Julian and St. Athanasius and the early Byzantine emperors following Constantine. Now we'll get into the book reviews of our modern historian. Henry Chadwick, an Anglican scholar, wrote this influential history of the early church, and this book is a joy to read, and we quote from him often. And we have Edgar Goodspeed, this history of early Christian literature, and this remarkable history covers the manuscript history of most of the early church works, plus lists the many works that have been lost in the sands of history, which leads us to ask the question, what would have happened had the works of the Library of Alexandria been preserved? And there's also several excellent translations of the Apostolic Church Fathers. And this early Christian writings includes all of them except for the Shepherd of Hermas due to its length. And it also has excellent introductions. And Michael Holmes, who is a doctoral student of Bruce Metzger, uh, has an excellent affordable modern translation with the Greek originals. And it also has excellent introductions. This excellent history by the Orthodox scholar John McGuckin uh, covers the first millennium of the church, and it includes chapters on how the church influenced many aspects of daily life in the ancient world, which will inspire many of our future videos, and reviews both the history and literature and theology of the early church. And we also have a three-volume set, and here's the first volume of The Faith of the Early Fathers, and it includes works and fragments of the church fathers, and includes many that are hard to find elsewhere. One of our favorite series is Pelican's five-volume set on the history of Christian doctrine. It includes many snippets from the original works and a balanced discussion with very little polemic bias. And he always consults the original works in the original languages whenever possible. This guy was a genius. Pelican assumes that you have a basic knowledge of church history, so you'll probably want to read Henry Chadwick first. We also have the second volume on the spirit of the Eastern Christendom included. And the other three volumes are on the medieval church, the Reformation, and the modern church through Vatican II. Bart Ehrman has an excellent series of lectures on the Apostolic Fathers of the Great Courses, although this course is not in the Great Courses Plus or One Dream yet. We want to caution our listeners that he seems to have lost his faith, but, however, he treats the works with intellectual honesty, so he's still a good source. And this is a thumbnail we use for many of the videos on the Apostolic Church Fathers. And Dr. Wikipedia has an article on this painting of the Disputation of the Holy Sacrament by Raphael, painted in 1510, one of the Vatican paintings. In this painting, Christ is flanked by Virgin Mary and St. John the Baptist, with St. Peter, Adam, St. Paul, and Moses nearby. And above Jesus is sitting God the Father, and below you see the Holy Spirit. Below, the altar is flanked by theologians who are depicted debating the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist, including the original four doctors of the Church, and Pope Gregory I, and St. Jerome to the left of the altar, and St. Augustine and St. Ambrose to the right, along with Dante and other popes, and fifth from the right stands St. Thomas Aquinas. 